say welcome to all of you uh, and echo the, 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 the invitation for you to just be here and be part of this church as others have already done. And uh, I want to tell you, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here at Open Bibles. Nice to see you guys. We're glad that you're here. And we're kind of continuing in this teaching series uh, this week uh, that we've entitled Making Gains, Making Gains. And Making gains, do you even lift, bro? And do you even lift, bro, is kind of this little saying that they say around the gym when people show up to the gym and, you know, they kind of pretend like they're working out a little bit. You know, you get to the gym and, you know, you got your makeup all on nice and your hair's all done nice and, uh, and uh, you're drinking your smoothie and you're stretching, you're taking selfies, but nobody's actually lifting any weight. You got to do some weight. You got you to challenge yourself if you're going to make some gains. And so they ask the question, do you even lift, bro? And really this kind of idea of making gains is really all about making spiritual and personal gains as we go into 2020. And it's really important, I think, because we kind of go through times in our lives sometimes where we feel stuck. And, uh, and, and this Sunday we're going to be talking about, uh, we talked about lifting your attitude. We've talked about uh, lifting in different areas. We're going to be talking about lifting your grit. Lifting your grit, your sense of just being able to persevere, to be able to finish really well. And, and sometimes when we're stuck in life, it's hard for us to want to finish. How many of you ever felt stuck in life at any point in time in your life? Right? Either you're not old enough or you're just lying to me or you're not listening to me this morning. One of those three things is in there probably. But I remember there was a time in high school when I really felt stuck. I, I had this, uh, gotten a car. It was an old car, but it was new to me. It was an old Mercury Capri. It was handed down to me from one of my siblings. And I soon uh, got that car, and I thought I was pretty hot stuff with that car. I thought I was the coolest kid in my peer group uh, because some of those guys didn't have a car, and they needed a ride, which made me very, very popular. And, and so one day after school, you know, I thought I'd, I'd head out, and we are going to take some back roads on the way back home, and, and I'm, I'm going to show these guys just really kind of how cool I am. And, and, and so I thought I'd show them how fast I could take a corner, you know, with just one arm, you know, kind of James Bond-style kind of guy that was in there because I'm cool, right? And so I'm going as fast as I can, driving like James Bond, on, and I didn't realize that there was a curve coming up on the road. It was a really sharp curve. It was almost a 90-degree cur curve, and, and I, I got the pedal to the metal, and I can't stop fast enough going around this curve, and we go flying off the road, right in, off into, uh, in, into the gravel and all the way over into this ditch. And after we came to a complete stop and everybody was okay, I knew that I was in trouble. I was stuck. Uh, I, I tried to get the car out of the ditch, you know, I put it in gear and, and, and I tried to move it back and forth and the wheels were just kind of spinning that's there and uh, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. The, the, it, the back end, it kind of elevated off the ground and, and, and it was in the ditch. It, it just wasn't going to go anywhere. My friends and I are looking at each other and I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. That's what it feels like when you're stuck. Your wheels keep spinning and, and, and you aren't sure what to do and you can't get out of the situation that you're in. And Some of you might be that way in a relational situation. You might be stuck at work. You might be stuck in some area of your life that deals with health. You just might feel stuck in some areas, maybe even in your faith and in your walk with God. Maybe even as a church, we might feel stuck in some areas. Now, there's some things that you just can't change, right? Sometimes you feel stuck and there's, there's really nothing that you can do outside of just taking your cares and concerns to the Lord. But other times you, you can uh, do some things about getting unstuck. And we've been asking God over the last several weeks for the wisdom to kind of know the difference and then to attack some of the things that we can change in our lives. And so for me to get unstuck, I needed to get some help. We've been talking about the last several weeks about what it really means to, to get some help in our life. To, to get unstuck in different ways. We talked about willpower kind of working in our life, right? And, and how that really isn't enough to have willpower. We need more than willpower. We need God power working in our lives. And we looked at some different pieces of the puzzles that we needed to kind of put together to get the right picture so that we could make some gains in our lives. I'll bring it up here on, on the screen as well. We talked about uh, want power, and then we talked about the desire to change, right? And this, this idea that the truth of the matter is sometimes I don't want to change. Sometimes I don't want to obey God. And if I'm honest, if I'm transparent before the Lord, and, and the good news is, is that God can give us that desire if we'll just go and get honest with Him and go to Him and, and tell Him, God, we, we change the want, we change the desires in my life. We talked about friend powers and, and, and how important friends are in our life and, and that you really can't live your best life with the wrong friends. 
And there's some people that you got to get out of your life, and there's some people that you got to intentionally get in your life if you're really going to grow. And friends are very important in helping us grow and move forward and making gains in our life. You talked about habit power and how it's better to win, uh, win small than to lose big, right? And if you just kind of make some small adjustments and some small incremental changes in your life, how it can make a huge impact in your life. And so they were just talking about grit power, the, the power to persevere, to see it through, to, to finish and to finish well. Now, I needed to get out of that ditch when I was in high school. First of all, I already had want power, right? Because I wanted to get out of that ditch. And, and I knew if I didn't get that car out of that ditch, one way or another, there was a certain parental unit that was going to get intimately involved in my life. And if that particular parental unit called Dad got involved in my life, little Jeffrey Martin was going to have some problems. And so I, I had plenty of want power. So me and my friends, we got out of the car, we put our minds together, and we kind of got a little bit of a plan, and we put some stuff underneath the tires, and we begin to rock that car back and forth, and, and I was in the driver's seat, and you know, we'd go up a little bit forward, go a little bit back, a little bit forward, a little bit back, and eventually we got that thing moving, and with some friend power, and with some want power, and then it took us almost an hour to get out of there with some grit power, we persevered, right, because we get in that car out of that ditch. We got out of that situation. And I tell you that story because I know some of you feel like you're in a ditch right now. I know you just kind of feel stuck and your wheels are spinning and you aren't sure if there's any way that you can get out of your ditch. But I want to tell you this morning that your ditch is not your destiny. Your ditch is not your destiny and God can do a work in your life if you will allow him to do a work in your life. And, and if you allow him to help you to begin to get some traction and move forward in the life that he's calling you to live. And I have really kind of one big idea today that I want to share with you and that's simply this, that your setbacks can become your setups for your comeback. Your setbacks can become your setups for your comeback. We all have setbacks in our life and we find ourselves sometimes in a ditch, but we don't have to stay in the ditch of our lives. And so throughout this teaching series, we've been kind of opening up the book of Romans and we've been kind of studying from Romans chapter number 12 the last several weeks. And I hope that you've been reading and meditating on that passage with me these last few weeks. It's, it's not too late for you to go back and go online and catch up and continue to read this passage and just let that soak into your life and I want to go back there with you again this morning so if you have your Bibles open up to Romans chapter number 12 beginning at verse number 12 if you don't have a Bible there might be one there in the end of your pew uh, you might have it on your electronic uh, device uh, maybe it's in your bulletin we'll try to bring it up on the screens but open Bible we want you to we want you to open your Bible we want you to know for sure uh, what we're talking about is in here. So Romans chapter 12, verse 12, when we get to the red word. I want you to say it out loud with me, right? And Paul says this, rejoice in our confident hope. In our confident hope. He says, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality, right? In the beginning of, of, of Romans chapter 12, Paul kind of started it off and he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, uh, we need to have this type of response, which is really kind of a reference back to earlier in the chapters in Romans where he makes this whole case, this case that he's making all throughout Romans, that we've been justified by faith, uh, that Christ has died on the cross in our stead so that you and I can be forgiven and so that our lives can be set free. And, and remember Romans chapter 8, he tells us that there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus and that we've been given God's spirit, that we're his sons, that we're his daughters. And, and he finally gets all the way up to Romans chapter 12 and he says, therefore, in light of all of these things, then he says, give your body as a living sacrifice. Remember that? We started off this series going that way. And then we go all the way here to Romans chapter 12 and towards the end, he's going to give us some really super practical uh, things now to, to, to do in our life. He's going to give us all kinds of basic practical things to do. And it, and it, kind, of sort, it, kind, of, it kind of sort of anchors in this whole idea of rejoicing in hope. Rejoice in hope. When things get hard, when you feel stuck, when you feel like your wheels are spinning, what can you do? One of the most powerful things you can do is to continue to rejoice in your confident hope. And to be able to do that, I, I would say this, you need to picture your better future. You need to picture your better future. Picture your better future in your life. 
I saw some kids' homework assignments here this last week where the teacher asked this question, what would the 100-year-old you look like? And, 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 and so there were some various different responses, so I thought some of them were pretty classic, so I'd share a few of them with you this morning. Let's look at this first one. This first kid says this. He says, 100-year-old me, this is what he says, I will play Uno with my grandchildren, I will wear a sweater all the time, I will take naps every day, and I'll take my wife to Pizza Hut for dinner. Right? That 100-year-old me sounds better to me all the time. It's in there right there. That's just living it right there. I'll bring up the next one that's in there. This person said, someday, if I get a boyfriend, if, if I ever get a boyfriend, I might let my parents come on the date, but they have to sit far away from us. That might happen because I might not get a boyfriend. Right? And I can tell you, as a dad with a daughter, I'm all for the not getting the boyfriend part, right? Here's this last one. This is from Graham. Graham's asking, you know, what's this 100-year-old him going to look like? He says this. He draws this picture of him breaking out of the tomb. He goes, right? He says, my 100-year-old me is going to be breaking out of the tomb. Boy's got some spirit, right? There's something powerful that happens to us in our lives when we picture a better future. I was once... Uh, I uh, went to a gym with some of my friends. Uh, I, I know that's hard for you to believe when you see this beautiful physique that's up here. But, yeah, I was working out. It was in there. And this guy was a real gym rat. I mean, he kind of worked out every day of his life, at, at least regularly for most of his life. And so he takes me to this gym. It's kind of this ratty, grungy, kind of pumping iron type of gym, right? It, it, it's kind of dark. It's in there. They don't got none of the nice equipment in there. There's no nice drinks that you can look over and get. There's no, you know, massage tables that are in there. Just a bunch of old free weights kind of all kind of crammed in this really tight space. But, but they do have uh, uh, some TV screens on the wall. And on the TV screens on the wall, uh, they're playing, but there's no audio. Uh, uh, there's just the visual of this. And they're playing this 1970s documentary called Pumping Iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, uh, anybody ever remember that? You can date yourself this in there, right? Maybe some of you have YouTubed it before, right? So, uh, you know, they, they're playing this, and, and I remember this, and I'm thinking to myself, what, what's the deal with this? And he says, they play that 24-7. Whenever the gym is open, Pumping Iron runs on the screen. Just Pumping Iron and nothing else. So I thought to myself, why in the world would they do that? You got these guys, you got Lou Ferrigno, who used to play the Hulk, remember, right? And you got Arnold Schwarzenegger that's in there, and you, you're watching these incredible bodybuilders and weightlifters on the screen in front of you in this old, dated, you know, uh, uh, video playing all day long. And, and it begins to dawn on me as I'm sitting there and I'm doing some curls with, with my weight that's in there. I get up there and I look on the screen, and, and, and Arnold, he's doing some curls just like me. He's doing them with five times more weight than I'm doing them, but he's doing them just like me, right? And, 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 and his arms are huge. And I look at him, and I think to myself, I, I'm looking at him long enough, and I, and I start to believe to myself, if I do this every day, I believe I could also look just like that. I could be the Terminator. I put the beach guns on him, baby. Maybe that and a couple hundred thousand dollars of uh, human growth hormones, but that's a different story, right? No, it's going to take a little bit more than the protein shake for me. But what were they trying to do? They're trying to show us a different future. And by looking at the different future, you're inspired to then go after it. And the Bible is constantly challenging us to remember our hope. Remember that hope that you have. Look, the Bible teaches us as followers of Jesus that the ultimate hope, the ultimate hope that we have and the ultimate home that we have is in heaven. And heaven is really just defined uh, by the presence of God in a very powerful, amazing, and ultimate kind of way for us in our lives. Heaven is this place where there's no more suffering, the Bible tells us. There's no more crying. There's no more tears. There, there's no more death. There's, there's no more dying. And, and we're to look forward to that. That's this place that we'll really be able to call home in our life. You see, when I'm here in this earth, in this place, I'm not a citizen of the United States. I'm not even a citizen of planet Earth. My citizenship remains in heaven. I am only an ambassador here of my king. This is not my home. This is not my final destination. I have a confident and amazing hope and an amazing future. I have a home where God is and His Spirit dwells day in and day out. And, and right here on this earth, I get to taste it a little bit. I have God's Spirit within me to send there. We have Him working and moving in our lives. But that's where our hope, our confident hope is really at. We've got to hang on to that hope. We've got to rejoice in that hope, especially when things get hard, especially when we feel stuck. And sometimes God allows us to go through some setbacks. 
Sometimes those setbacks are really hard. It's kind of like working out, right? When I work out, man, and I, and I work out really hard, Thomas gets me out of the racket court, racquetball court, and we get over to the gym. They're sitting there. My, my first thought when I get back to my house is, am I going to be able to make it up the stairs? You know what I'm saying? Huh? Ed, you know what I'm saying. You're bending over there trying to, trying to look over there, get the dishes out of the dishwasher. I'm like, oh, Jesus, help me. Right? You know what I'm saying? Am I going to be able to stand up? Because when you work out, right, those muscles, they break down. They get sore. They hurt a little bit. you got to break them down before they can be built back up so that you can be strong again. And that's how setbacks work in our lives. Sometimes God allows us to face some tough stuff, some setbacks. But if we will allow him, he can break down some things in our lives so that we can be built back up. And listen, the breakdown precedes the breakthrough. Your breakdown is preceding your breakthrough. And, and so to try to change something in your life, you got to go after something. you got to get some friend power working in your, in your corner. You need some want power. You need God's power. You need habit power. But the challenge is you, you start moving forward and, and you start to make some gains and, 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 and you hit a brick wall, right? It, it starts to feel harder before it gets easier for you in your life. And, and when that happens, you can't give up. You need grit power you got to grind it through sometimes. And one of the ways that you're able to grind it through is you remember your confident hope. Sometimes you go through the breakdown to get through the breakthrough. And, and what happens is you're going in those moments and, and you hang on to your confident hope when you get there and you're stuck in those places. you got to keep rejoicing. He says, not only hang on to your confident hope, remember what he says? He says, keep on praying. Keep on praying. And prayer is a way that we can visualize a better future for us in our life, right? Because we know and we can see a God who knows the end from the beginning, who has all power, who created all things, that there's no place, no heights or no depths, that he's not there and that he knows you and that he loves you. And, and you can visualize and he tells us that he has plans for you, plans for you to prosper, to give you hope and to give you a future, an ultimate future that God has for you, but, but also for other things that you're praying for and asking God to do in your life, right? And, and he says, keep on praying. We were talking about this last Wednesday in our, in our, our prayer service last Wednesday night, 6.30, and we were talking about this idea, you know, if, if Jesus, the King of all kings, who's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that all things were created through him and by him, if he stepped out of his heavenly throne and wrapped himself with flesh and had all power available to him, if he made a habit of praying regularly, how much more should we? He says, Keep on praying. Keep on holding to the faith. Rejoice in your confident hope. Rejoice in the fact that God forgave you and worked in your life. Rejoice in the fact that God showed up and he rescued you when nobody else was around. Remember the fact that God did it before and that he can do it again. God pursued you. He relentlessly came after you. And not while you were doing good things, while you were in the midst of your sins, while you were in the middle of offending you. God would not let up on you. He kept after you doggedly. He is that kind of God and you remember that. He's moving and work in your life. He's been for you when nobody else was for you. And, and, and he's the one who understands you even in your darkest moments, even in your quietest places, even when the things that you've done the worst in your life, and he still loves you and he still wants you. Remember that he fills you with joy and he gives you good things in your life. He provides for you. He takes care of you. He restores you. He makes you part of the kingdom of God. And not as a slave or as a second class citizen, but as a son or as a daughter, as a joint heir with his son, Jesus Christ. You and I are children of the king. And we have all the rights and the responsibilities and privileges of being part of the family. Walk in those promises. Rejoice in that every day. And in my own life, I... I've just seen rejoicing in that hope kind of gets me out of a ditch. Kind of gets me moving forward. It helps me to persevere, to not give up, to keep believing, to keep trusting. And if you're going to lift your grit, you have to picture your better future. Here's another thought if we're going to let our setbacks really become a setup for our comeback. And that is not only to rejoice in our confident hope by picturing a better future, but something that I'm going to call hug the cactus. Hug the cactus. Sometimes you and I, we got to hug the cactus, right? I don't even remember Mel Gibson, you know, as a guy sort of couldn't do anything wrong, you know, as an actor. He made all these amazing films, uh, Lethal Weapon, all kinds of things like that in Hollywood. He made millions of dollars, and, and he made The Passion of Christ. And, and some of you might remember, it was right after he made that film that's in there, he, he kind of has this drunken moment, and he's caught on film, and he's making all of these racial slurs and all these other things. 
And when this kind of gets revealed, his life just kind of blows up. He, he's, he, he's just like in a mess. And he came, became for a season kind of like the most despised guy in all of Hollywood. And one of the things that I love was this speech some years ago that Robert Downey Jr. gave at the low point of Mel Gibson's popularity. Robert Downey Jr. stood up in the front of his peer group and uh, he had asked Mel Gibson to present this award to him in front of all of these Hollywood elites and pretty much that was the only way Mel Gibson was going to be invited to anything that was in there at this point because he was just at this low point and everybody despised him. They, they would never have let him get up there to address him before. So he, Robert Downey Jr. gets up there, he stands up and he, and he says, when I was trying to get sober, Mel Gibson was the person who came along in my life and told me to lean into my faith. He told me if I was willing to hug the cactus, I might become a man. If I was willing to do the hard things, I might actually get clean and sober. And Robert Downey Jr. went on to say he gave me a job when nobody else would give me a job. Put food on my table when nobody else would put food on my table. And he ended his little speech by saying, look, I think Mel Gibson's hugged the cactus long enough. It's time for me and you to just forgive him and to offer him some forgiveness. And I love that image because when I think about moving forward, when I think about making gains, we, we don't often think about the pain that sometimes can be involved in our lives when it comes to healing and hurt and unforgiveness. And last year, I, I tore my calf playing racquetball, and I was in this pain, and, and and I was thinking to myself right after it happened, I'm like, oh man, this guy like an old man injury. How'd this happen to me? I'm a young man. I tried to walk off the court and everybody's asking me, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I get home and Frida's asking me, are you okay? And I'm like, mm, I'm going miss any pain. I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And she asked me again, you know, because that's what you do when you love somebody. You ask them over and over, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm okay, I'm okay. And she asked me again, I'm okay. I'm like, yes, are you sure? You're, yes, I'm okay. She asked me one more time, and I'm thinking to myself, if you don't stop asking me if I'm okay, I have no idea whether I'm okay or not. But just give me a minute. I'm just kind of sitting there on the edge of the bed there for about 30 minutes. I kept thinking to myself, man, something's torn. Something's just not right. I lived hobbling around for several weeks. I never went to the doctor because, you know, you need to self-diagnose because what do they know, you know what I mean? And, and uh, if it was really torn, it would look differently. So, I, you know, I'm just going to, what are they going to do? They're just going to wrap it up. I can do that, you know, so I, I'll just deal with it. That's how we often deal with pain, right? Go through pain in our lives, and, and as soon as this happens, what do we say? I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. I talk to people, you know, their family kind of blows up. They go through a divorce. It, it hasn't even ended yet. How, how, you, how you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. You got fired at, at, at work. You, you got transitioned at work. You, you got passed over for a promotion, and, 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 and you're in the midst of all of this pain, and you're processing. How you doing? I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. That's what we do. That's our, that's our knee-jerk reaction, right? I'm okay. But often we have no idea whether we're okay or not. Because it just takes a little while for us to kind of sit on the bed after the injury, if you will, to say, am I really okay? What do I need to do to get okay? One of the things that we can do in our lives is, is hug the cactus. I got this cactus up here, right? It looks kind of nice. It's in there. It's got these really sharp prickly things that are on here, man. If I went to look over there, give that thing a really good hug, I'd get all those thorns in me. It'd be a little bit of a bloody mess that's in there, right? And it doesn't look so nice to be able to look over there and hug and can you imagine giving that thing a big old hug? That would hurt, right? Be awful. But sometimes from a spiritual point of view, hugging the cactus, so to speak, can be one of the most powerful things that we can do. What I mean when I say hug the cactus is do something that's uncomfortable. You might have to embrace some really tough stuff, some prickly stuff that might initially want to make you want to repel back from it, but you've got to pull into it. You got to get serious about some interior stuff in your life. And hugging the cactus may mean going to counseling. Hugging the cactus may mean forgiving somebody in your life that we really enjoy holding anger and bitterness towards. Hugging the cactus may mean exposing your secrets. In recovery, we, we talk about you're the only one, you're only as sick as your secrets. So hugging the cactus may be, mean getting honest with some of the things that you've been keeping secret in your life. Hugging the cactus may mean trying to make amends with those that have hurt you in your life. 
hugging the cactus may mean going from, you know, back from an interior standpoint of view, starting to work through and deal with some of the things that happened in your childhood. Some things that you went through in your home when you grew up. You say, why, why would I want to hug the cactus? Why would I want to do that? Well, you deal with those things so you don't continue those things. You want to let God transform your pain so you don't transfer your pain to others. You want to hug the cactus so you don't make others hug your cactus. It's hard. And it's not a lot of fun, but it can be so powerful. Look what Paul says. Look, go down to verse number 14, Romans 12, 14. He says this, bless those who persecute you. I don't know about you, but that sounds like hugging the cactus to me. Bless those who persecute you. Don't, don't curse them. Pray that God will. You want me to pray that God will bless the people who hurt me, who stepped on me, who crushed me, disregarded me? Isn't it enough that I just didn't choke them out, God? Come on. I should get points for that. I'm supposed to bless those who persecute me. He goes on and says, be happy with those who are happy. Okay, I can do that. That's easy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. And I love how practical God's word gets with us here. He's talking about blessing people that have hurt you. Blessing people that have persecuted you in your life that have discriminated against you probably in the context of Romans he's talking to the Roman church about people and they're being persecuted for their faith for their beliefs right and people can persecute you for a whole lot of different reasons he's saying what do you do with these people bless them even though they do harm to me bless them you pray that God will bless them sounds like hugging the cactus I don't want to Bless them. Well, you're going to have to go back to the top of the puzzle. Ask God for some want power. God, help me to want to bless them. But I can tell you, if you've been hurt and you've been damaged, nothing will hold you back for as long and as strong in your life as unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will keep you stuck. How do I know that? Man, I've wrestled with it. I'm wrestling with it now. So how do I do it, Pastor the practical part for me is how I do it I fix my gaze on Jesus if I'm a disciple if I'm a follower of Jesus then I then I look to him and Jesus was perfect he, he knew no sin he, he harmed no one he blessed everyone and and yet even still they falsely accused my God they they brought him to trial a mock trial and false witnesses bear false testimony against him and midst of this trial he's mocked he's spat on he's slapped he's had the the hairs of his beard torn out he's beaten he's whipped his flesh is flailed open across his back he's brought in again they're trying to coerce him to confess the false charges but he doesn't and then they condemn him to death they take him and they nail him on the cross his hands and his feet carry his own instrument of death down the Via Della Rosa, the road of sorrows up to the hill called Golgotha the way of Calvary. And they nail my Jesus to the cross. And as they are nailing him to the cross, he says, Father, forgive him. And if Jesus can forgive him after all of that, I can begin to forgive someone who, you know, broke up with me, didn't treat me well on the job, you know, took a little extra line on me, put the fence up with my neighbor, or whatever the fence is that somebody else did is trivial in comparison to what they did to my Jesus. Many of us are not going to break free until we begin to learn the process of unforgiveness and get to a place of forgiveness. Look, it's not about the person that you need to forgive. It's about you. It's about me letting go of some of the things so that we can be free. We can 
let our setback become a step up for our comeback. Listen, God has a plan for you in your life and uh, in mind for you. He has a plan. He's working. He's moving wherever you're at. Whatever you're going through in your life right now, maybe a, a guy or girl, they broke up with you. They broke their heart. You can't see your way forward right now. I've gone through that. But, man, I'm glad I went through that setback because I look back now and I realize, man, that wasn't a girl for me, man. And I had to go through that setback so I can get a set up and so I could get some things changed in my heart and in my life that I needed because one day I was going to meet this girl by the name of Frieda and she walked by and I go, hey, how you doing? God had to do some preparation in my life, right? He had to do some things so I could get there in that place. My setback had become a, a setup for a comeback, but I had to begin to see it that way. I had to do the hard work. I had to let God grow me and become more mature in my life, a less selfish man before Frida was going to be able to take me on as a husband. Maybe you had a dream and your, ultimately your dream didn't work out and it collapsed. It didn't go the way you thought it would go. And you, you're frustrated. You're upset. And listen, I've had some dreams that didn't go the way that I thought that they should go. And I had some endings that didn't end the way that I thought that they should end. That's just part of being human. But the good news is today I look back and I'm so glad that God didn't honor some of those dreams because they would have led to disaster in my life. You know what I'm saying? Anybody ever look back, ask God for some things, and you came back later, I'm going, ooh, I'm sure glad God didn't give me that one. He's given us some other dreams, and sometimes that setback is a setup for your comeback. Let him do a work in your life. Let him forgive you and heal you and do what only he can do for you in your life. Hug the cactus. It's really hard stuff in your life you need to get real with. It. And this last idea, and then we're going to be done. If you want to kind of lift your grit to persevere to finish well, you just got to keep doing good. You just got to keep doing good. Keep doing good. Look at what Paul says. Uh, 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 it's in here, Romans 12. You, you know, when we're stuck and it's so tempting to just stop and to just give up, to just throw in the towel and say, I can't do it anymore. You got to keep doing good. Romans 12, beginning of verse number 17, says, Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will revenge, I will avenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing so, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. And I love this part that's in here. Don't let evil conquer you, but, but conquer evil by doing good. That's a pretty sweet job description, isn't it? What do you do? I conquer evil. How do you do that? Conquer evil by doing good. You see that? I conquer evil by doing good. Look, evil is in our world. I mean, all you have to do is look on the news, uh, go on the internet, uh, re-pick up a newspaper, uh, look at people's responses to one another on social media. It's everywhere, all around us. There's, there's evil all the places in there. I mean, this guy just this other week just go running around stabbing people downtown Colorado Springs, stabbed eight people that's in there. There's evil that's out there. There's also some good in the world, right? Some good things. At least the Patriots aren't going to another Super Bowl, right? There's some good things going on. Amen. Praise the Lord. But there is evil in our world. And evil is not the final story. One day God is going to ultimately deal with evil. One day God's going to set all things right. Don't, 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 don't kid yourself. One day God's going to call all accounts and they're going to have to be settled. But until then, our job is to push back on evil in our world by doing good, by being kind, by showing love through our actions because of what God has done for us. This last week I was reading this article uh, from the guy by the name of Dr. Robert Greene, and, and, and Dr. Greene had marched with Dr. Martin Luther King in some of the early uh, civil rights marches, the, the early civil rights struggles, and, and he was sharing uh, a, a, a portion of his story in this article that kind of really stood out to me. He said uh, one of the most powerful things that he ever seen in his life is that he was in Memphis one day and he was in the back seat of the car and, and Dr. King was in the front seat on the passenger side of the car and they, they had pulled up and the, the window was down they pulled up to a gas station was there and he said he pulled to the gas station and when they did a, a white man walked up to his car and he pulled out a gun and when he pulled out the gun and, and, he, and he put it in Dr. King's face and he, and he said a slur word and he says I'm going to kill you. He said, I watched Dr. King from the back seat, and he says, it's like I can even see it today. He says, Dr. King slowly turned his head and looked the man in the eye. He said, I love you, brother. He said, that man just stood there. 
looked at his gun, didn't know what to do, and walked away. He said, that was the day I realized Dr. King was not afraid to die. He was not afraid to die, but he was afraid of people repaying evil for evil. For people to stop doing what is good. Dr. King learned to do that. Is he the example? Learned it from my Jesus. You gotta keep doing good, even when people persecute you. You gotta keep doing good, even when they reject you. You gotta keep doing good, even when it's hard. You gotta keep doing good when you wanna quit. You gotta keep doing good when you wanna throw in the towel. When you wanna tap out. When you when you wanna when you wanna just go home. Uh, when things just shouldn't be this hard in your life, you got to keep doing good when it, it shouldn't have to be this hard, when it's, when it's hard uphill both ways in your life, right? As my daddy used to tell me, you got to keep doing good when things are just difficult in your life and they're not changing. That particularly, you keep doing good when you know you got a setback and another setback and another setback comes. Listen, don't tap out. Don't give up. Keep doing good. Friends, wherever you're at in your life, we want want power in our life, together with friend power, together with habit power, together with grit power, it can help you make some gains and some experience, some change in your life. And we'll just move forward with an understanding that there's setbacks we've been through can become setback, setups for our comeback. And look, our struggle and our difficulty and our ditch is not our destiny. We've got a new place where we can go that God's prepared in advance for us to do. And listen, your breakdown may be happening right now. Your, your breakdown precedes your breakthrough. You got to make up your mind and say, God, listen, I'm going to trust you even more than I trust my feelings. I'm going to trust you even more than I trust my very own eyes. I'm going to trust you more than anything else in my life. I got to make up my mind to say, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what it takes. Even in the hard stuff, even in the tough stuff, I'm going to walk in faith and I'm going to believe that my best days are still to come. I'm going to rejoice right now, even though I feel stuck right now, even though I haven't gotten the, the comeback yet, I'm going to rejoice right here in the midst of what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to do that because I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on my confident hope in you and the future that you have for me. Friends, if we'll do that, I think it'll have a powerful pull to help you get unstuck in your life. One of the ways.